Well, I think you'd all agree that there are not many rock stars in the world who can compete with our speaker tonight. So uh, Bono or whoever else you are, please move over. This is, this is a very exciting evening for us. It's um, a wonderful combination when you put, not only when George Soros is willing to come and speak at CEU, which is always a pleasure, and then you combine that with the Euro crisis, and you allow the person who is making the announcement to actually give you some breaking news. All right, they're all wondering, what is that news? Um, I, I am told as of about 10 minutes ago that the Greek prime minister is, has offered his resignation, and it's not clear yet that, that it has been accepted. So in any event, that gives you a kind of topicality to the evening's events. Um, but on a, on a calmer note, and a shall we say, a more philosophical note, which is an appropriate note for how to start uh, this evening. Um, this is really an outflow uh, and, and an additional chapter of a wonderful series of lectures that George Soros delivered at CEU in 2009, in which he discussed his views on politics, on economics, on financial markets, and above all, on open society principles. And at the heart of those lectures was the theory of reflexivity, which is a complex theory. You've all received uh, the paper, but it rather boils down to the simple statement of the relationship between thinking and reality may not be what we have always thought it is. And this is a wonderful exploration that George has taken us on. He has long been involved in exploring the world of what he calls reflexivity, the relationship between those uh, thinkers and the reality in which they're engaged. Uh, clearly, as he pointed out in 2009, uh, the complexity of that relationship is especially fraught in human behavior and nowhere more so evidently in 2009 than in financial markets. Uh, and so today, we are extending this theory of reflexivity under his leadership and looking at it in the context of social change, social and political change. What is the relationship between thinkers and reality in the context of social and political change? And we have, of course, uh, many global laboratories at which to, in which to look today, um, starting, of course, with the events in uh, the Middle East and North Africa, the very exciting developments involving what's called the Arab Spring, but also in terms of today's headline and particularly today's lecture, the Euro crisis, which is a, a remarkable place to look at this theory of reflexivity. Um, George Soros certainly doesn't need an introduction uh, and certainly doesn't need an introduction at CEU, but I can't resist giving you a short one anyway, George. Um, you are our founder. Uh, we are uh, your university. We are very proud of that. Um, some 20 years ago, George was skeptical about building a university. He said, I'm much more interested in challenging institutions, and he certainly was doing that in the context of the failed institutions of the old regimes in this region and many other institutions. But he was finally persuaded uh, to build an institution. And it was an institution, a new university, based on the principles of open society. And 20 years later, uh, we are all your children and we have, in fact, developed into this remarkable university that is transnational and has students from, drawn from some 140 countries and faculty from over 40. And it is a remarkable experiment itself in uh, open society, reflexivity, and uh, certainly international and transnational activity. Uh, Don't fallibility. fallibility, of course. Well, I was going to come to that. Thank you very much. That, get, that allows me, uh, George, to give you my favorite quote, my favorite Soros quote, at least in the context of this uh, evening. Once we realize that imperfect understanding is the human condition, there is no shame in being wrong, only in failing to correct our mistakes. 
So I, I, I commend to you that proposition, which, is, which also, I think, demonstrates why George Soros is, above all, a philosopher. And he is a philosopher for our time, our time of uncertainty and complexity. So I'm very pleased that I can also introduce Anatol Koletsky, who is the chairman of the board of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and a distinguished uh, political uh, economist himself uh, and a frequent author in many different dimensions. And uh, Anatole and will have a conversation with George and draw out many of these issues that I've just briefly touched on now. So please join me in welcoming George Soros and Anatole Koleski to the stage of the CEU. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, as, as John said, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor for all of us to talk to you about reflexivity, particularly on a day like this. Uh, the title of what was originally going to be a lecture, but I think is going to be even more, well, certainly from my point of view, even more interesting and exciting, but uh, a conversation uh, between us was going to be about reflexivity at work in the European Union, and what better illustration can there be of that uh, phenomenon uh, than what is going on right now. In fact, I've thought for quite a long time that the creation of the euro by Jacques Delors and Helmut Kohl was actually uh, deliberately designed to illustrate your theory, not just to enrich you uh, financially, but even more to enrich you and the world intellectually by illustrating in the clearest possible form all the, all the um, issues that you have raised in your work about reflexivity, uh, human and institutional fallibility, the influence of thinking participants on reality and reality back again, boom-bust cycles, far from equilibrium conditions, revolutionary change, you have it all there, and it's all in a microcosm in, in, in this very day. So I think it's a wonderful, uh, you know, rich tapestry of subjects. I think to start it off, uh, the best thing would be if you could outline in more general terms, and then we'll gradually move to the more and more particular, in more general terms, how your philosophical worldview what it really has to say about the current situation. And then I'll try and pin you down more specifically about whether the euro will survive or, and so on. Very good. Well, we, we are actually having uh, this workshop, uh, two-day workshop, uh, discussing um, the theory and practice of social change. And uh, the, the euro crisis is a, a very good practical example for studying it. Um, and uh, um, uh, you, you've been distributed a, a copy of the uh, paper I gave describing my conceptual framework based on uh, the, the uh, uh, twin concepts of uh, uh, fallibility and uh, reflexivity. Uh, I had basically explored this mainly in the context of financial markets. Uh, and there I, I, I used this two-way connection uh, between people's perceptions and the actual state of affairs um, um, to develop a theory of, of, of uh, boom-bust um, uh, a, um, a, a tendency that is actually there is in every in every bubble there is a an element of reality something that actually is happening in the real world, which is uh, in some ways misconstrued uh, in people's perception, and that there is a, 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 a an interplay between the misconception and the tendency, which is initially self-reinforcing. Uh, where both the tendency and the, um, the, um, the misconception is reinforced uh, by this interplay, this feedback mechanism, where ev and eventually 
the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, perception runs so far away from reality that it becomes unsustainable. And then it sort of reaches a, a, a plateau um, or a, what I call a twilight period and eventually uh, it, it can, uh, it then uh, generates a self-reinforcing process uh, in the opposite direction. And that's the boom-bust process of bubble that actually occurs in financial markets very often. So the, the theory, that, theory uh, that markets, financial markets always tend towards equi equilibrium is false. Uh, the the uh, markets can produce or tend towards equilibrium or move away from equilibrium uh, with equal frequency, if you like. Uh, both both uh, processes are there because there's this, self this uh, feedback which is either positive, which then reinforces itself, or negative, then it corrects itself. Uh, if the positive predominates, then you move away from equilibrium. If the negative, then of course you come closer to equilibrium. So you have uh, near equilibrium conditions and far from equilibrium conditions. And that's the uh, uh, bubbles which now have become extremely popular uh, or in people's perceptions. Uh, now, in, in uh, financial markets, uh, uh, bubbles have a peculiar shape. The, the bust is usually much steeper and sharper and shorter than the boom. The boom develops slowly, gathers momentum, um, and the plateaus, and then when the, then the, when the, uh, the, the other side sets in, it accelerates um, and leads to a financial collapse. That's the crisis. Um, um, the reason for this as asymmetry is the role of, of uh, credit uh, in uh, markets, which uh, um, actually you find that uh, uh, the both credit and leverage is at its maximum uh, at the peak of, of, of the boom. Uh, and then when, you, when uh, prices decline, uh, the, uh, the value of the collateral declines um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, doubtful credit outstanding which has to be liquidated and then the, the forced liquidation of, 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 of credit and leverage is what creates this catastrophic uh, 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 decline. Now, uh, this is in, in financial markets, but you actually have similar processes in other spheres of, um, of uh, human in interactions, certainly in politics, but actually you probably can uh, discover it in, in, in uh, um, uh, domestic life, marriage. <laughs> so uh, it's a very, it's a, you, you, it's a, it's generally it's a, it's a, a, a human phenomenon. It just financial markets are particularly good for studying it. So, and so could you, so uh, maybe to make it specific, uh, why don't you describe exactly how this process has worked in the, e in the formation of the EU? And ultimately, the euro, unless you want to talk about marriage first. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, actually, there is, a, there is a similarity between marital relations and currency, uh, currencies, <laughs> uh, uh, because you find that whatever system prevails, the alternative is more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, 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 I think the European Union is actually a wonderful example of a, a boom-bust process in, in politics. Uh, it's initially self-reinforcing, and when it when the and then eventually it could turn 
and become uh, uh, self-defeating. So maybe you could explain what, what, what no. was the idea no. and what was the bias yeah. in the yeah. creation. Now, the other yeah. thing yeah. I want to point out, that, that uh, uh, the European Union as a history also is very much involved with the concept of open society because when it was proposed and in the, in the, in the, um, the period of integration or of uh, positive development, it really had a remarkable um, uh, similarity or relevance to the ideal of an open society because um, it, it, it was led by a, a, um, uh, some far-sighted uh, leaders who, uh, who um, uh, realized that, that uh, all human constructs are imperfect, that you, we need to improve it. He, they practiced what Karl Popper uh, um, called piecemeal social engineering. So it, it was a, in, in, in probably the most successful instance of, piece, of, of piecemeal social engineering in, in human history. Because starting <coughs> with a limited objective um, uh, and setting a goal and generating the political will, um, setting a deadline uh, and, and moving forward, knowing that that step will not be sufficient and you will need another step. Uh, the coal and steel community was developed into the, the, uh, became the European Union in a matter of maybe 20 years or, or, or so. And it was uh, uh, led by uh, the, 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 the ideas of uh, <coughs> democracy, open society, uh, human rights, and so on. So it, it was a very inspiring idea also. Uh, so that was, in a sense, the positive trend so in the fundamentals. Was, so it and was where a, was the bias then? So it was a, it was a self-reinforcing process. Um, and the leaders were always in the forefront leading this process of integration. And it reached its maximum extent um, uh, when the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, with German reunification, where Germany recognized that to reunify Germany, it can only be done in the context of a, of a, of a stronger <coughs> European Union. And so Germany was the, the motor that drove the, the process uh, uh, forward. Um, and it culminated, in fact, in the reunification of Germany, the Maastricht Treaty, and the introduction of the Euro. Um, then there was a period of digestion um, uh, and s s stagnation. And it then entered a period of disintegration. And that came after a few years after the crash of 2008. And that's where the financial uh, uh, boom-bust process kind of uh, interacted with this political boom-bust uh, mm -hmm. process and reinforced it on the downside. Uh, but could I suggest to you that, in fact, it's, it's even closer to your theory than, than uh, what you have described, because what you've described is a trend, in a sense, in the very positive fundamentals of European integration, which started with creating uh, peace in Europe, ensuring the conditions for that, and as you say, the step-by-step -step, uh, uh, social engineering of creating a unified Europe. But then there was a bias, that's what I ask you. Where was, where was the misconception of that? I would suggest that perhaps the misconception was the idea that you could take the next step, which was the creation of a single currency, without having taken the prior step of creating the political 
union in Europe that is necessary to keep that currency together. Is, 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 is that correct, or would well, you interpret yes, it another way? But I think that the, uh, certainly the euro was the, the key to this. Uh, but uh, but uh, the, I think that the, the, the designers of, euro, of the euro uh, knew that it was an incomplete structure. They, they, they were conscious of it. Uh, because a, a currency needs a, a, a common central bank and it needs a common fiscal policy or a common treasury. And the, the, this was only a monetary union, it was not a fiscal union, not a political union, so it lacked the common treasury mm -hmm. and the common uh, fiscal policy. They knew it and they knew it was incomplete, uh, but they, they had the expectation that when the time comes and you, have, uh, you will be able to generate the political will to take the next step. So it was a step forward in the expectation that a further step forward would be needed. Now, uh, the euro had this incomplete structure, the, lacking, the, uh, the lack of a common treasury, it had other, sh other f shortfalls of which they were not aware, mm -hmm. but which have now surfaced. Uh, um, but uh, when the time came to, to take the next step, at that time the political will could not be mustered. Well, uh, so what were, the others, what were these other shortfalls that, that, that are key to the situation now, do you think? Well, well uh, first of all, it was mixed up with the s sort of market fundamentalist uh, uh, beliefs that were dominating uh, economic theory uh, um, at the time. And there was a belief that uh, markets uh, tend to equilibrium, that uh, the, the imbalances only uh, arise in the public sector, that the private sector can be left to uh, to be uh, to uh, correct its own mistakes, uh, and that turned out to be uh, a false belief, a very fundamental false belief, which was at the root of the crash of 2008, uh, uh, and th then of course it also. Uh, um, affected uh, the situation in, 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 in Europe. Now, in, um, in, the, in the crash of 2008, the financial system actually collapsed. And it was saved by the authorities uh, by a very uh, a de uh, uh, delicate uh, maneuver. Um, because credit co collapsed and they substituted the credit of the state to, to, make, to make up for the, the uh, private credit. So effectively, they, and it was actually st um, started in Europe, um, at, at the end of the um, uh, IMF meeting in uh, uh, November 2008, the um, finance minister left a day early, went to Paris, and they declared uh, effectively that, they, that there will be no other uh, systemically important financial institution allowed to fail. Um, they effectively guaranteed the financial system. Uh, the United States fol followed. Uh, and then Angela Merkel, reading the, um, the political <coughs> opinion correctly at the time, said, yes, uh, we'll guarantee it, but we won't guarantee it jointly, but only severally. That is to say, each country will have to take care of its own uh, uh, financial system and guarantee it. And that was actually the first step 
uh, in the process of disintegration. And I think actually this whole process is has even more of the characteristics of your boom-bust uh, typical cycles uh, than you have uh, described so far because, as you said, there, there was this trend of political integration and then there was the belief in the political integration and that belief, once it permeated the markets, encouraged the additional borrowing and lending by the peripheral countries because it encouraged market participants to believe that a Greek debt or an Italian debt is the same as a German debt. Bec so it was very much a mutually reinforcing process and the moment you describe when Germany said, well hang on, these are all separate debts, these are not European debts, was the moment of truth when the market suddenly realized, my God, this Greek debt is not actually European debt, it's Greek debt. And that, would you say that, that was Absolutely. that an accurate description? Uh, uh, but actually the moment of truth, interestingly, uh, came quite a few months later. Okay. Uh, 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 the first reaction of the market, because it's very important to, to realize markets are not always right. In fact, they're very often wrong, because they are important, but they're not necessarily right. And so the, the first thing, of, the first reaction of the market was great relief, and uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, it's only actually quite a bit later, in fact almost I think a, a year later, uh, when Greece suddenly revealed that uh, their deficit was much greater than, than uh, there was a new government that came in that was, uh, wanted to reform the Greek uh, uh, economy and revealed that the previous government had abused things and uh, there was a 12% uh, 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 shortfall in, 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 uh, in the budget uh, uh, deficit. Uh, and that's when uh, the, um, uh, the uh, markets realized uh, the weakness in the, in the euro structure. So they were a bit late in recognizing. But importantly, but not let just... Me, yeah. Let me explain, it's very important here that uh, because of this flaw uh, in the construction of the euro, when the euro, uh, uh, wa the euro was supposed to uh, be, uh, bring about convergence of the economies, uh, when the euro was introduced, the ECB uh, accepted the government debt of all the countries on equal terms at the discount window. So a, a uh, Spanish bad, Greek bonds, Italian bonds, were all, German bonds were all could be uh, in, deposited and they were considered riskless and therefore you could uh, uh, borrow 100% of the face value from the central bank. And that led to, but the, let's say, at that time, uh, uh, Italian bonds yielded a f few percentage more, Spain, Spanish bonds yielded more than German bonds. Therefore, the German banks and French banks rushed in and bought uh, Spanish bonds rather than German bonds as their riskless assets. And that's the beginning of the Euro crisis. Uh, and because that reduced the, the interest rate differential, so there was a convergence of interest rates. But there is, uh, the convergence in interest rates created a, a divergence in economic performance and competitiveness because Germany uh, had to carry the burden of reunification. It had a big increase in its, uh, in its uh, public, uh, uh, in its, uh, uh, public debt because it had to spend so much money on Eastern Germany. You remember uh, German, the East German currency was exchanged for West German currency at one to one. Um, and East Germany needed a lot of subsidies, and therefore the uh, German industry uh, tightened uh, and cooperated with the trade unions, cooperated 
So, so Germany greatly increased its, uh, its efficiency and competitiveness. Uh, and at the same time, the uh, re uh, reduction in the, the ability to borrow uh, cheaply created a housing boom in, uh, in Spain and Italy and other countries. And uh, uh, Spain cont and, and, and uh, Ireland continued to uh, uh, operate uh, their fiscal uh, policy c c quite uh, uh, soundly, uh, uh, but there was a tremendous expansion in in um, uh, borrowing on on real estate. Uh, so you had a a, a big boom, uh, and naturally, as a result of of the boom, uh, the, the, those countries became less competitive. So the convergence of interest rates. Actually, actually created a divergence in competitiveness. So that was again because uh, German banks and Dutch banks thought it was the same to lend for a construction project in Spain or Greece as it would, would be to lend for a construction project in Berlin or Amsterdam because it was in the and same currency. And, and not yeah. only that, but there were, con yeah. uh, there were projects to lend uh, to, to in, in, uh, in Spain and there weren't that many in, in the so, so this was, a, a, again, a case where an initial uh, misconception or an initial error in the policy formulation was amplified and prolonged by uh, a belief of the market in that, uh, in that misconception. Y yes, and that, of course, was in the private sector. Yeah. But uh, the private not, sector, not, exactly. Uh, no, uh, Greece was different because in Greece there was a lot of, uh, 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 let's say, ex uh, 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 mishandling of, of public funds. Uh, the structural funds were mishandled. Um, and, and so the, Greece is, a, yeah. in that sense, a, a special case. Uh, the other countries were actually uh, running their uh, their fiscal policies qu quite correctly, and and Spain, uh, even at the beginning of the of the uh, euro crisis, uh, Spain had a, a lower uh, uh, debt to equity debt, debt to uh, to GDP ratio than Germany, Germany, much lower. So so finally, I'll use my prerogative finally to ask you. We've been talking about history, how this built up. What do you think is really happening? What, 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 what do you think is the most li likely outcome, literally, in the next days and months? And then we'll have about 15 so, minutes for questions from uh, the floor. Well, let me, let me first uh, uh, point out uh, something that is, is not uh, properly recognized, but a very important part, because uh, the, this is really primarily a uh, euro crisis, pr primarily a, a banking crisis, it's and a, uh, and a, uh, uh, a debt, uh, government debt uh, crisis. But the two, the two are interconnected, reinforce each other in, uh, mutually. And there is a third crisis, which I think is a political one, because now there is a process of disintegration. And that is very important to, to realize because the euro crisis has the potential of destroying the cohesion of the European Union. So it's a, a real threat uh, to, to the political uh, uh, union. Now, the, the, this um, uh, negative dynamic uh, came into play because the leadership once the process of disintegration started, stopped pushing forward and wanted to preserve the status quo because, uh, because they realized that a cha any change is likely to lead to disintegration. Therefore, they wanted to protect uh, what has been accomplished. And they stuck to the status quo uh, uh, as if it was un immutable. 
yet it had been constructed uh, knowing that it has to, be, to that it was incomplete and needed change. So all the, anybody who recognized that this, the status quo is untenable uh, or intolerable uh, uh, was pushed into an anti-European political posture. And that's how you had, you know, the, 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 the true Finns uh, uh, emerge in Finland, and that's how uh, Germany uh, uh, became, uh, the, the, the idea of a transfer union uh, became uh, a, a, a uh, uh, curse word for the European so what has So what has to happen now to prevent this disintegration and do you think it's actually likely to happen? Yeah. Now, the, the authorities saw no solution for the Euro, for the Euro, when the Greek crisis bro, uh, broke up because uh, they couldn't go to a fiscal union because the political will for a fiscal union wasn't there in the heyday of the European Union. Since then, the political atmosphere was deteriorating, so it was impossible to, to, to advocate uh, uh, anything like a common uh, treasury. So they wanted to buy time. And actually, uh, when you have a financial crisis, buying time very often works because uh, you, you, you calm the markets and, and uh, let's say, the, the resources you use to calm the markets actually produce, come up with a, with a profit uh, because uh, values which were uh, 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 particularly depressed come back to more normal uh, levels. But in this case, time worked against uh, the authorities because of the political uh, 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 dynamic that I was outlining. outlining. So, uh, 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 buying time uh, reluctantly, uh, uh, the authorities always acted at, at doing too little uh, too late. And, it, uh, and uh, this made the, 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 the crisis grow. It was a relatively small Greek but crisis. Do you see any change in that now? Uh, uh, is there well, enough? That's okay. a, a very good point. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, had they done what they are willing to do now, you know, the Greek crisis could, could, could have been easily contained. But they insisted at first to provide some support, but at penal interest rates. So the interest, the debt kept, kept on growing until Greece really became totally, uh, uh, um, uh, the debt is unsustainable, and there's no way that the present level of debt can be sustained. There has to be some reorganization of the debt. So, uh, um, uh, this kept on happening over a period of time until, so they this can, kicking the can down the road. But actually we came to the end of the road. Um, uh, with the creation of the, uh, this uh, new instrument, EFSF, which is the embryo of a common treasury. Um, and it was then uh, declared by the German Constitutional Court that that's okay, but no further steps uh, of, of uh, delegating uh, 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 powers uh, can be accepted. Every further, every delegation of powers has to be approved by the by the Bundestag. So, so so far, but no further. And actually, I mean, Germany is clearly in the driver's seat. Germany is now dictating the economic policy for Europe. 
doing so reluctantly. It is something that Germany uh, very much wanted to avoid, given its past history and everything else. But being the, the most uh, eff uh, eff efficient, largest, and, and most successful economy, uh, uh, the creditor country with the best credit, uh, it was pushed into that uh, situation. <laughs> And, and, and uh, um, they, 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 they are unfortunately uh, uh, advocating the wrong policy because they say Germany is successful, uh, therefore every other country should become like Germany. But Germany is a chronic creditor and not everybody can become a chronic creditor because for every creditor there has to be a debtor. So uh, they, they were advocating a policy that is impossible to, to, to implement. Uh, I, I think there has been a substantial change in uh, the attitude of the, of the uh, German leadership. They realized that they have made a mess of it. And they are determined to save the euro. And they are right to do so because actually there, there is no choice because the euro ha is, exists. It's imperfect. Uh, we mentioned some of the imperfect, imperfections. But you can't actually uh, undo it. You can't unscramble the omelet. The, the, the uh, assets and liabilities of the financial system and the whole economy are so intermingled based on a single currency that you can't undo it because you, some people would have a windfall profit, other would have a windfall loss, and you wouldn't know who is broke and who isn't. So the financial system would actually, you would have a financial meltdown. I think that's a very important point that uh, it amazes me how people in the uh, media and even in the markets uh, don't seem to recognize. Uh, one constantly hears comparisons between a situation, analyses where it says country A would be better off without the euro or with the euro. And the point is that if the euro did not exist, it would not have been invented now given what we know. But it does exist, and therefore the cost-benefit analysis, as you say, of unscrambling the omelette is completely different from the cost-benefit analysis, which perhaps should have been done 10 years ago, about whether to create the euro. And I, w One of the things that surprises me is that, for example, in Germany, the politicians have failed to get that point across. Would, Actually, you, would you agree? Yes. But as I say, there has been a change of hearts, heart, and, and there is a desire to, to, do, to do the right thing. And unfortunately, however, uh, they are not doing the right thing. Now, I, I have to be um, uh, rather, uh, uh, how shall I say, blunt about it, um, even though it's not a good thing to paint a, a dark picture. But I think you have to face reality and then if you face it, you can also remedy it. So the fact that they are still doing the wrong thing doesn't mean uh, gloom and doom, because they can, they can still get, get it right. But the longer they wait and the further you go, the bigger the cost. In other words, it will be most co co more costly and will require uh, more um, resources, etc., and the fallout uh, will be uh, will be bigger. So, uh, right now, we are at a crisis point, and uh, in uh, and what they are doing is again uh, too little, uh, too late. Okay. Well, before we end, I will no, I will pin you down I, I, into saying. I don't want to should. end on that okay. note no, no, because no, I actually, okay. yeah, I understand, but yeah. I I have to to explain that there is yeah, uh, uh, yeah. there is a, a, the right way. Right. And actually, uh, I, I must express, in a way, 
my uh, frustration because I have uh, both pri privately and publicly outlined uh, the, the right way. I published it several times. Uh, and I believe it, it would have been adequate uh, 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 today. And even if it's un un inadequate today, it can still be adequate tomorrow. In other words, there's still a, 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 a way to go to solve the problem. Uh, and eventually, I think we will get there, but it may be just very, very uh, costly. Because what you, you have to first, it's, it, 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 the, uh, there are several steps you have to take, uh, but first you have to uh, uh, so the, uh, sort of calm the markets. You have to reassure the markets that you are in, that for that you need two things. The, the, um, the leadership, the authorities have to be united and they have to be, uh, have adequate resources to carry out the, um, uh, the um, uh, uh, plan behind which they, they are uniting. Uh, as it is, uh, they, they are unfortunately not united. There's been a lot of differences between uh, France and Germany, and uh, the the resources won't can't be stretched to because they want to do they want to recapitalize the banks, and they want to uh, um, provide a guarantee for the um, for the banks for the um, government bonds yeah. sovereign bonds. Uh, uh, a European guarantee that would bring down the interest rates, and what they, uh, and um, and those are the wrong way to do to do it. The way they should have done it is not to recapitalize uh, uh, the banks now, when the banks are, uh, you know, the shares are at a, uh, at a tremendous discount to their asset value, and. Uh, the asset value is very low because the bonds uh, that they hold uh, are uh, uh, under, uh, are below their costs. Uh, what they should should have done uh, is to guarantee the use the the EFSF, this new instrument, to guarantee the banking system against uh, f failure. Uh, and uh, uh, in exchange, assert or uh, get the banks to follow their instruction. And the instruction would be not to reduce their balance sheet, which they are doing now, which is one of the reasons why you have the crisis. Maintain their loan portfolios, their credit lines, put in inspectors to make sure that they don't take risks for their own account that would uh, that could endanger them, uh, uh, and then uh, that would remove one of the uh, problems. But then uh, uh, the second step would be to uh, uh, encourage uh, Italy and Spain uh, to issue treasury bills, Re reduce the interest rate eventually to, let's say, half a percent by the ECB, uh, uh, encourage uh, Italy to borrow short term only, uh, is issuing treasury bills, mm -hmm. and encourage the banks to hold their liquidity by holding treasury bills, which is as good as, as cash because they can sell it to the ECB at any time uh, and yields more than uh, uh, assets that they would maintain at the, at, the, at the central bank. And that would enable Italy to borrow at less than 1% and suddenly uh, everything would look very different. So that would have, that would have been uh, the, the uh, solution that would have worked. And you could have also even uh, done something about Greece. So that's that's the 
the path uh, that, they, that they're currently missing. And it could still happen. I think uh, we have about maybe 10 minutes, uh, so I want to give the audience a chance uh, for a, a few questions. Maybe if, the, if there are several questions, uh, you, if you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, yeah, there's one there. Uh, well, let's have that one first. Thank you. Are there, do we, uh, I think there's one there and one there. So we'll have two questions and then you can, you can answer those. Uh, should we have a microphone up there? Because there are people in the other rooms who won't hear. Do we have any mic roving mics? Or, or do you want... Uh, 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 I'm Zsuzsanna Szabó, I'm, I'm a journalist from Napi Gazdaság. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Soros, that do you see any chance of uh, Greece uh, exiting the Eurozone? So just before you ask that, shall we have one, one the Yeah, you know, thank you, Brit Parliament Ambassador of Estonia. Uh, there is much talk about euro crisis, debt crisis. Uh, would we go back to the fundamentals, the role of credit? The conventional thinking says that credit is good. Isn't there a crisis about mm, living beyond one's means? We, we have perhaps, or increasingly are in the direction of, of borrowing too much that is not sustainable. Would you comment on that? Thank you. So, so I think do the Greek one yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, um, there would there, uh, the Greek debt has to be reduced, um, and there is this pressure to have a voluntary reduction, a haircut of fifty percent. But that only applies to the private sector. And therefore, it only reduces the, uh, the debt of Greece by 20%. And that's not enough. The, the, the ECB, the central bank, is uh, dead set against this because uh, they bought a, a lot of Greek bonds and they own a lot of Greek bonds and they would uh, 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 there, uh, they would suffer a loss. Uh, they d they did it, pushing the the envelope in trying to save uh, uh, the uh, uh, the financial system. Uh, the 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 constitu the uh, constitution of the central bank only uh, allows them. Uh, to maintain the stability of the currency. So, uh, but it is the normal role of a central bank uh, to uh, try to preserve the financial system. Uh, the solvency uh, risk they took should have been taken by a treasury, but it didn't exist. So now that the EFSF has been created, it should actually have uh, have taken over the Greek bonds uh, from uh, the uh, central bank and from the IMF, and actually also uh, uh, reduce that burden on uh, on Greece, which would then give Greece a chance to work its way out of the, of the debt crisis. Uh, that was the other uh, opportunity that was missed on this occasion. Uh, so that would have been uh, the, the, uh, the way out uh, for Greece. Now, uh, there is a real danger of a disorderly uh, default. Um, it's not at all um, sure, but it is a real danger, uh, and as I say, uh, a, a scheme like this could still be uh, uh, the solution. There has to be, uh, there, there can be a, a, 
voluntary reorganization or a, an involuntary reorganization, in other words, default, but it has to be done in an orderly way, and particularly uh, the, 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 the Greek banks have to be uh, um, uh, kept alive, and the depositors have to be protected. Because if you don't protect the Greek depositors, then you are liable to have a run on the banks in other countries uh, as well. So that is the danger of, a, of a, what I call a meltdown. And it's, a rea it's real, uh, 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 but as I say, it can be avoided. Now, so the second question was uh, this the, issue of can you cure debt yeah, with yeah. more debt? And that, of course, brings you to the other uh, uh, unsolved problem. Because if, if um, all countries are uh, uh, in, indulging in, in, uh, 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 in austerity, um, and you have a number of countries uh, that have to go into internal devaluation within the euro system by reducing wages and 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 prices that sets up uh, 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 deflationary uh, pressures and the debt burden is a ratio between the the the, the accumulated debt and the, 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 the uh, gross national product. And if the, uh, that keeps on, let's say, you, by austerity, you, you um, reduce the expenditures, but you also reduce uh, the GDP, your debt burden actually grows. So this is a trap, and a trap which is the exact opposite of a of, of a bubble, it's a it's a black hole, and you if if uh, if one individual country does it, it allows them to uh, to uh, readjust. But when everybody does it at the same time, uh, then you have a, a, a depression, and that is what is facing uh, the European Union, even if you. Uh, um, contain the financial crisis. Uh, and that is the next uh, uh, job, is to find a way to stimulate uh, uh, the European economy as a whole. And given the legal constraints that, are, uh, that apply in Germany, which is moving towards a balanced budget, I think this can only be done on a European level. And that it would be the next step after the immediate crisis is brought under control. There's one more question there and one there, and I think that uh, will be so. Michael? Question. Carlo Jäger from the Potsdam Institute. As you mentioned the expression of the black hole, I have a post on the internet page of the Financial Times called EU Economy Black Hole or Green Growth. The reason I put this title there is that I agree with you on the very short-term need to just avoid financial meltdown. But if we do not recreate a common European will for a common European project, we'll not get out of this. And if we don't have a political support for going beyond austerity, it's really going to be bleak. And it seems to me that the only perspective which the European people are somehow willing to envisage as, let's say, a European dream, is to see Europe as a pioneer on the path towards sustainability, towards these green things which people like, and in particular in Germany like. So it seems to me, if we do not recreate a political project around this idea, we'll see self-reinforcing black hole mechanisms in various places, and you cannot know where it will blow up next, but it will blow up. No, I entirely agree with you, and I think you, you, you've got to find a way to, uh, to uh, uh, reinvent uh, 
the European project because uh, for better or worse, the euro is here to stay. You can't, you can't actually uh, uh, do without it. But th that leads to a, uh, forcing people to live together. It's a shotgun marriage. Uh, and and it's, it doesn't lead to ha uh, domestic harmony. Uh, uh, so there has to be something positive. And there was something positive about euro. Europe, and there is, a, it, there, it, there is still something very positive about Europe. It has to be rekindled uh, on, on, on the political uh, level. And I agree with you that, that a common project like green growth is a very good positive uh, uh, goal uh, for getting that process uh, uh, going. There was one more question, and then we'll have to end. Uh, Rex Miller, unaffiliated. Uh, just, okay, Rex Miller, unaffiliated. Uh, just to go on with what you said, could you comment on the Occupy movements and their belief that without correction of corruption and the associations between producers? Uh, He's saying, a uh, very good question, can you c comment on the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Occupy City movement, uh, y and, and, and their belief that without uh, recreating the whole moral framework uh, that has also fallen apart in addition to the financial no, system? No, I, I'm on record of, of expressing sympathy with, with the, with the uh, feelings of the people uh, who are occupying Wall Street or St. Peter's, St. St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, because they are victims of of mistaken policies and uh, uh, the uh, uh, a non-functioning uh, uh, financial or mis misfunctioning uh, financial system. Uh, so uh, it's an expression of of of. Uh, Frustration, and and uh, it's a legitimate it's a legitimate expression. But you you understand that they have a program for political change, and it would mean something if somebody like you could associate well, it. Uh, it. It depends uh, how it develops and in what direction uh, it, it, it develops. Well, let's say uh, it develops in general strike and the call for well, resignation. You see, that becomes uh, uh, counterproductive. The trouble is that uh, reality is very complicated and uh, uh, people look for simple answers. And uh, especially in, in, in moments of stress and fear, uh, everybody is tr trying to uh, 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 advocate its own, his own self-interest. And uh, yet the European project requires cooperation. And cooperation is something that you can achieve in, in, in uh, uh, times when there is hope and and uh, and, uh, uh, and and a functioning leadership, and at the moment you don't have that. But okay, I, I think that's enough. Oh, but 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 I think actually the the point is is very well made, and I we we've got to finish now. And there's been lots of fascinating ideas, which I won't even attempt to summarise, except for, for one point that I think what 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 this whole theory of reflexivity is about is the re interaction between ideas and reality, and the way that that can generate either positive or negative feedback. So we have virtuous circles and vicious circles. And this is very much uh, what the story of Europe is about right now. Can you turn a vicious circle back uh, into a and virtuous And particularly uh, the role of misconceptions and lack of understanding uh, has in shaping history. Thank you very much, George.